All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I hope you're having a, a great Friday afternoon or evening or um, possibly Saturday morning, depending <laughs> on where you're watching from. I got on this morning or this afternoon and um, <clears throat> and Daryl was in the chat like 20 minutes before the start of the, of the show at what was it like 545 his time in the morning uh, amped up and ready to go. So thanks for for watching all the way from New Zealand, Daryl. We appreciate he, you. He is a self-proclaimed early riser, and that is early. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the the kudos on the the jingle. That's that's from uh, Stream Beats. He's got a whole um, album of beats that you can use for for YouTube, and they're like retro gaming themed, you know, which obviously is kind of like my theme that I'm going for my office. Um, I've even got my my Game Boy shirt on today, feeling very uh, Nintendo y. Um, That's so, so weird because that. as it was playing, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I'm getting ready to play like Ninja Gaiden. And I was having like flashbacks <laughs> to like my NES days. So I, I'm glad yeah. I'm not the only one that has that <laughs> thought when the jingle comes on. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm excited. I'm getting into uh, garage sale season now in the United <laughs> States. So it's like, um, one hobby that I have, I have way too many hobbies, but one hobby that I have is um, retro gaming. So upstairs in our loft, I last year I bought a 27 inch uh, Sony Trinitron CRT television. And um, underneath that, I've got everything from the NES up through the Wii. So the GameCube, the N64, Super Nintendo, um, they're all hooked up all the time. And then I went around to garage sales and bought all of the PlayStation generation so i've got ps1 2 and 3 and an xbox 360 this year i'm hoping to go around to garage sales and buy all of the sega system so the master system the genesis the saturn the dreamcast and um you know put together i don't know like a dozen retro gaming consoles so I'm i can walk to spring. a classic video game store it's like a 10 minute walk from my house it's called video game world and yeah. they have like all of that stuff like so like I, I could basically fulfill your sega wishes in like an afternoon because yeah. they have like all of that in the in there oh yeah there's there's a bunch of retro gaming stuff you know here in kansas city too but it's like you you pay you know high dollar for it it's a lot more exciting to be like, you know, yeah, go to a garage sale and, hey, you got any old games you want to get rid of? And then they like pull out some box of just, you know, hundreds of dollars worth of games. And they're like, ah, I don't know, 20 bucks. <laughs> you know, so so it's my I actually company. have my original NES, SNES, N64. Mm -hmm. I still have most of like my original games managed to like somehow keep those over over the years. They're actually in, yeah. the, in the closet right there. So I... So I, you got to get like a free old CRT yeah. TV, throw your back out, trying to get it in the house. <laughs> um, the one we got is like a hundred pounds. And me and my wife carried it up the stairs to the loft. She's like, I'm never moving this. You're not getting a bigger TV. Nope. Nope, it's fine. <laughs> You'll see her in the chat. She's saying, um, you know, that you had a big Trinitron growing up. We had, when I went to college, my parents like went from a CRT to a flat screen TV, like a plasma in the early 2000s. So I took the 36 inch Sony down to college with me and it took five of us to carry it in the, in the house. Cause it was over 200 pounds with the 36 inch one. Yeah. And uh, we ended up leaving it with the house and I kind of regret that, but it's funny. You mentioned the aquarium in the chat because uh, I used to, I ran like this, um, this uh, in college, I ran this, like this venue basically that was an old abandoned building in the university for um like punk bands to to come play shows and stuff i kind of ran that whole thing and in the back it was the old art building there were dozens and dozens of old apple IIe's, old like macintosh computers leases things like that and um we we thought about like taking some of those and like gutting them out and there was a, a trend back then where you could like get um plexiglass made to fit inside so you'd have like an old retro Apple computer with an aquarium in it um, with live fish. I thought about doing that. That takes me back to college. <clears throat> Should go and uh, talk to Andrew Connell. He's got uh, quite the custom uh, aquarium and uh, yeah. fish setup. You guys kind of have a meeting in the mines and like come in, like, you know, all of his experience running some of the, 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 the automation and things like that on it. And you could come in with like the Triton Tron uh, aquarium. 
Yeah, that would be cool. I've got I've got a little CRT back here, the little screen that I'm pointing at. That's a tiny little CRT. I want to replace that with I'm looking to get one of those iMac G3s. That's like the mm -hmm. colorful yeah. iMac. I want to replace that and um, figure out a way to to get audio and video input to it, so I could turn that into like a retro gaming uh, monitor. I think that would be a lot of fun. But enough about that. Talking about you know the past and. <laughs> and retro, you know, 20 plus years ago, um, we are here actually to talk about new stuff and things that are emerging in technology. So um, the topic for today was to deep dive into uh, the new Microsoft Teams. And, you know, some, some people might've been like, well, what's new about Microsoft Teams? You might've seen, what was it, two weeks ago now? It was like two Tuesdays ago, or maybe last Tuesday, they announced that uh, the new Teams is here. And what that means is it's the new desktop client. Um, some people are calling it Teams 2.0. I think technically it's Teams 2.1 is the, the versioning for it. But um, it's completely re-architected uh, from the ground up desktop application for Microsoft Teams if you run Windows. So we thought we would go through today taking a look at like how to get it what benefits it can provide, what's the current state of it. So, um, you know, we're Microsoft MVPs. So naturally we have kind of a positive slant on Microsoft technology, but <laughs> just out front, um, Dan criticism. from Twitter was, every time I was posting about it, he's like, it's not even ready yet. It's like, I know it is not ready for, you know, enterprise wide. We're not rolling it out to our 400,000 users, but as technologists, we, we should start playing with it understand what the gaps are and we're going to show a lot of those gaps the things that you can't do today and we're going to kind of end out with um you know what our thoughts around like when should you switch and start adopting like depending on the kind of person you are maybe you want to start looking at it maybe you want to let things simmer for a little bit longer but uh we'll talk about all of that cool stuff today um and andy just put in the chat this is the the blog post you have that blog up don't you andy i do yep yeah let me throw your screen up there and we can kind of scroll through like what does it include you know um you've probably digested this a little bit more than me um so if you want to talk to that yeah so i've uh I've sat in on um a few different uh announcement meetings around this uh there were some in the microsoft partner communities and then there was mm -hmm. some uh, internal stuff and then there's uh, some of the public release and that's what we're actually seeing here this is the the public uh, release blog the main things the biggest takeaways and uh, it was i think we had like three big bullet points that we kind of advertised for this particular session is number one it's it's re-architected on the back end so they say that it's faster simpler more flexible the main takeaway from that is that um it is faster, significantly faster. They, they've, they've got some side-by-side -side comparison videos here. I'll play this in just a second. But it is significantly faster, and even getting hands-on with it, it's faster. And part of that's because they're moving away from Electron, and I think they're rebuilding a lot of it based off of like React. And mm -hmm. so it's not consuming as nearly as many resources on your local PC as it, as it was before. So things load way faster. Um, we'll play the video now. I know I'll look forward to that faster booting on all of my virtual machines because I've got like six VMs yeah. that auto launch teams and it takes forever because they're like really CPU constrained. So you can see like the new teams has been done for quite a while. <laughs> Nine seconds to boot. The classic teams uh, ended up taking like 22 mm -hmm. seconds. Um, they mentioned, you know, as they're moving through here, just some of the channel switching being faster, um, scrolling being faster, joining a meeting. I've seen this. This is significantly faster. We'll demo this today. It's it's really quick. Um, so that that's a huge thing. And then the memory usage, 50% memory reduction. And I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of this actually in practice, which is really cool. So definitely re-architected uh, from, the, from the back end. From, and then some other things, uh, more flexible and it's smarter. So the smarter thing is 
one of the things that I'm really excited about, and that's for those of us that have to work in multiple tenants and work with multiple Microsoft accounts. So like if mm-hmm. I'm, you know, you know Daryl working with a whole bunch of different clients, I'm probably logged into more than one Microsoft tenant at any particular time. And switching back and forth between those for the last few years has been painful to say the least. Now, multiple tenant support, not only with one email account, but with um, multiple email accounts. So I can actually switch back and forth between my various tenants. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to be able to receive notifications across tenants. And when they say smarter, if I'm going to join a meeting and I'm in the wrong tenant, it's going to suggest or auto switch me over to the right tenant so that I get the best experience in the meeting. Uh, Yeah, I definitely want to check that out. This, yeah. in this live stream. Uh, Tom put that in there. I, I echo, I, I think the third person <laughs> that this is my favorite feature as well, the multi-tenant switching. Like what yeah. I do personally is I live half of my life over in the Microsoft tenant because of like Teams Tap and like all the other stream advisors and stuff that I'm in. Um, so I, I have to run that Edge browser all the time and being able to like gather up those notifications in the same tenant switch back and forth i'm really looking forward to that um unfortunately i'm a mac user so i won't be able to enjoy this quite yet but um we'll we'll talk about that but yeah as a consultant i can easily imagine that you might have half a dozen tenants at any given time and now you'll get like a unified activity list so you won't miss things um, because you were in the wrong tenant yeah it's gonna be awesome and this is this is something subtle that you have to experience but you can be in a meeting in another tenant get a chat in like your main tenant and participate in that chat while staying in the meeting before Mm. you tried to react or or respond or anything, it would switch or you, you know, you'd, you'd have to exit out of the meeting. Now you can stay in the meeting and then still participate in in your main tenant if you need. So it's definitely smarter. Something we need to test too is, uh, can you, can you switch in the meeting? Cause you were saying like you could participate in the chat I, I don't think this is possible, but I'm wondering if you would be able to like participate in the channel chat because like that's one problem I have is like some of the Microsoft meetings I attend are in channels. So the chat doesn't load and I have to like go to the browser to, you know, yeah. read the chat. I wonder if that works across <laughs> channels or if it'll just be like, you know, chats under the chat tab. So I'll be surprised if it works across channels. Yeah. So we'll test it out and see how that goes. Um, And then, I mean, this kind of goes without saying it's new. So the UI has been updated. Uh, That's kind of subtle. They didn't really make huge changes to the user interface and like where knobs and switches go. But some things are a little bit different. Like in channels, Mm -hmm. things flow from the top to the bottom now versus scrolling to the bottom to get the most recent stuff. So like uh, channels being um, flip-flopped, up is down, down is up. So that's something to kind of get used to. Um, but outside of that, uh, they just kind of walk through a few of the things in the blog post. And then there's a link to a bunch of separate articles. We'll post these in here in the in the chat for those that are joining live. Um, there's a whole breakdown of, of the new teams. And this one is really good because if you scroll down, they have this um, ongoing checklist um it's kind of a parody list now it's mm. it's, it's high level it doesn't get into yeah. the details we're going to get into a lot of the details but it's high level and it tells you what's <laughs> currently available in the new teams versus what you had in the classic not everything is one-to-one yet there's a lot of features that they have to roll out those are coming in the fall <laughs> hopefully this year and and you know we don't have to yeah. wait too yeah, long which fall for that. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, they have the, they they keep this up to date. When I checked on this two days ago, when we were uh, kind of prepping for this, uh, mm-hmm. they, this was last updated on April seventh. You can see now it's been updated on April twelfth. So they must have updated it right after we met uh, the other day. Um, made a couple of additions there, and there's some um, some links inside of that. Um, if you are an admin, there are some things that you need to know uh, administration wise about being able to to roll this out. So they get you covered there. So this is definitely one I would bookmark. Again, I'm going to put that in the chat for those of you that are joining live uh, today. You should see that across all of our various uh, channels. Um, nice. but go ahead and bookmark that. Come back to it because they are, they are updating this and then pushing a lot of us uh, toward this. And then there's a handful of other um, uh, articles they've got. Try the new teams, the, 
the getting started with it, the instructions on how to do that. We'll show you all this live uh, here. Um, and then the new team's desktop client, this is learn.microsoft. So uh, this is where we based a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Um, some of the things that, um, mm -hmm. why, what features are still missing, for instance, we're going to go through and uh, talk a good bit about that. This article actually references that. So we'll get mm -hmm. that out there for you. And one more, hold on, let me paste this in. There you go. Uh, and then uh, here's another blog article for it where um, they've got some screenshots built in, um, some of the same videos. There was the uh, announcement um, portion of it, and this is the one that's actually in the tech community and a few more bullet points there. So a couple things to yeah. mention about this. This is in the preview program. So um, you do need to be in the it's public preview slash early access as it's transitioning. So it is part of that preview program and it currently is for windows only. So you do need to be on <laughs> windows uh, in order to use this. But before we dive into the deep dive, let me take a moment to introduce all of my Mac users to parallels. So <laughs> um, I've been a long time user of VMware and um, a couple months ago, um, Microsoft and Parallels announced a, um, a Parallels entry that supports um, Windows on ARM. So the new Mac devices um, are using the M1 and M2 chips, and those are based off of an ARM architecture. So they have a version of Windows 11 set up for ARM. You can uh, download and install Parallels with the Windows 11 ARM package. It took me less than 15 minutes to get Parallels, the Windows uh, 11, uh, downloaded and installed. The whole thing in less than 15 minutes. This thing on a Mac uh, with an ARM architecture boots up in like 20 seconds total. And then it, it runs like seamlessly side by side with my Mac. Now you get a, there's a 14 day trial to test it out. And then you can pick your plan, but you can basically pay like a hundred bucks for like a lifetime version of it. That's what I did because as soon as like, I knew like three days into testing it, I was like, all right, this is great. So I went ahead and installed um, Windows 11 um, on Parallels. And now I have the new Teams client running in my Windows 11 machine and it's already booted. It's done. I didn't even get the sentence out of my mouth and I'm already in uh, into Teams and it's running. Um, so for those of you on Mac, check out Parallels and the Windows 11 there uh, um, package. Uh, I personally think it's worth $100. If I had an affiliate link, I'd throw that out there for, for all of you. Um, but um, it's, it's pretty awesome. So I'll be demoing, yeah. uh, demoing in that today. Nice. And I use uh, Proxmox for my, my virtualization. So I've got uh, servers down in my basement. I'm just RDP'd over to this one. But I think the way for us to, to kick this off is... Um, I have not switched to the new Teams client yet for Megan Bowen, so I want to flip that switch, see how long it takes to kind of get um, get over and situated on there. But uh, Tom had a really good point as well. The Teams policy that controls preview has a separate toggle for this. So the first question to answer for those who are watching today or later on in the future is, how do I get this on for myself or for like a pilot group of people? Um, as you mentioned, Andy, you do have to have Teams public preview currently. And the way that you turn that on is you go to admin.teams.microsoft.com. So we're going to go there first and we're going to set up a Teams update policy. So if you go in, you're logged in as an administrator, Teams admin or global admin, you go over to the Teams section right here. And then under Teams update policies, You've got the one that's just global, which is the default for the entire organization. I don't recommend changing that one. But what I did is created a new one called public preview. So you can go add a new policy and then you can take that and you can turn on public preview. So make that allowed or enabled. And then that second toggle Tom was talking about is the new Teams client. So you can let users choose you can say it's not enabled at all, or you can say Microsoft controlled. Because right now, if Microsoft controls it, 
the toggle is available, but it is turned off by default. So you can go back and forth. Now, later on, if they decide to, you know, force the, the public preview into the new Teams client and you have it to Microsoft controlled, what that means is then it will be toggled on for your users that are in public preview. So it's important to know what you're doing between like if you want the users to choose on their own or if you want just Microsoft to take care of it. I just want to ride Microsoft's roller coaster. Um, I have it set right now to Microsoft controlled. And then I scoped this. So you want to select that and then assign users. I scoped this to Megan Bowen in my organization. So that's how you're going to kind of do the pre-work to get this available to your users. And then when they go in, they're basically going to um, go into the about section and then they're going to turn on public preview right there. So they go to the dot, dot, dots about public preview. And you'll know you're in public preview if it says EA right there, which is early adopter or early access. I don't know which one it stands for. But if it says EA at the top, then you see this little switch. So I want to flip that on and see like what does it look like for the user um, the first time they turn it on on a Windows device. So I'm going to set a stopwatch just to see how long it takes to kind of like switch over to that new world. And I'm going to do it right now. So it comes up, says get it now. Okay, great. So it's downloading and it's going to automatically open when it's done. So I'm at like what, 12 seconds because I clicked it a little bit early and it popped up with that extra thing. But um, the download should also be smaller because it's using more native controls like the web view uh, functionality, things like that. So it's not downloading like this couple hundred megabyte electron application. It's, I, I heard, what is it like? 60 megs or 70 megs, something like that. It's quite a bit smaller. Um, okay, so it is flipped over and we're in the preview now. And we'll, I'll wait till it loads up. And this is also on a VM that has uh, two cores and uh, eight gigs of RAM is what I'm running. And these are old like Xeon processors <laughs> as well. So it's loading up here, flipped over. I want to wait till I see my chats and then I'll stop the, the clock. <clears throat> Super exciting to watch. <laughs> but I, I want to show it live, you know, just to be like, okay, what's the first run experience? So when that came up, I stopped it at a minute and 17 seconds to basically flip over to that new client. Things are loading in still. Um, it's telling me I can schedule things for later. And now I can click around, I can go to my teams, I can go to my calendar, all of that stuff. So um, that's pretty good. I imagine that it's going to kind of settle some things down in the background and be running. But a little bit over a minute on an old computer, I'm ready to go with the new teams. Um, now I'm curious, what's it like to flip back and forth? Because it's not going to have to do the download this time. So I want to flip back and forth and see how long that particular thing takes. So we're going to turn it off, and I'm running the clock right now. See how long it takes to flip back to the old version. So it's relaunching that. You're getting that kind of, you know, probably about 20-second load that was in that video that Andy showed. We're at 16 seconds now. <clears throat> And then I want to flip back to it and see how much faster it is uh, on that side. Okay, so now I see my chats loaded in, and that was 28 seconds to flip back to the old version. Um, maybe I stopped it a little bit early, so maybe about 30 seconds. And then now we'll flip back to the new version, see how fast that is. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl, I hear the dot matrix printer starting up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I need that uh that window the, that america online you know welcome to come up there we go <laughs> okay so flipping to the new version was 24 seconds so you know it's about the same time to go back and forward um now that one that was like nine seconds that was like a cold boot of the team's client 
that wasn't flipping from one version to the other. Uh, so I kind of wanted to illustrate like what that was. It was 24 seconds to go to the new version, about 30 seconds to go to the old version. Um, so just something to think about if you have to flip back and forth, because I think as we're going to find, as we start like kind of clicking through some of these things and finding out what we can't do, um, you might be flipping back and forth fairly frequently, or you might be doing um, a, a life hack that our friend Caruana mentioned in one of the uh, MVP meetings that she said she likes to run um, the, the old client, the, the web version in the background because she does a lot of the things that like you can't do yet inside of the new client. So it might be easier for you also to just have it in the web version for now if you've got to like switch back and forth. And we'll talk about some reasons why you might be the type of person who's not quite ready to switch to the new teams yet. So, but that is installing the new client um, and getting it like up and running. What's the first thing we should check out? Um, uh, I, I guess the next question. thing to talk about is updates, right? Yeah, well, Daryl had a question. Go I just ahead. want to address this real quick. Um, so he was asking about the Parallels version that I mentioned, and I just want to bring okay. bring this up to the screen. So uh, mm -hmm. is this new? Yeah, the the Parallels version of Windows 11 is new. Uh, this was announced in February. I put a link in the chat window to it. But it is a an official Windows 11 ARM build. There were There was one previously. Uh, from Microsoft that was done through the Insider program. This is an official ARM build, and you can, when you purchase Parallels, you get it all. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is the pricing on that. I told you a minute ago it was 100 bucks. They're actually doing a spring sale. It's $20 uh, cheaper, and I, I, it's it's like 80 bucks. That's totally worth it to be able, for those of us That's on good. Mac, to be able to completely virtualize Windows. And there's a couple of different modes of Parallels uh, supports. Uh, this having used VMware for a really long time, I'm blown away by what Parallels has been able mm -hmm. to do and the performance is, is off the charts. So, which version are you on? You're on standard? I'm, yeah, I'm on the standard. Parallels okay. Desktop Standard Edition. Yeah. Nice. Um, so another thing Daryl said is now close the client, see how fast that is, because that's the thing that's improved. So I have I quit out of the client and I'm going to launch it again here and hit start on my stopwatch so it's running um we'll see when i see my chats pop up so we got that little bit of animation i'm also on an older computer so keep that in mind um and it's loaded up almost there okay so 23 seconds for that one <laughs> so it's only like one second less um but yeah, your mileage may vary. I think if I went over to my my Dell computer that's like, you know, an i7 and I launched that version over here. So like, let me, let's bring that one up, see how that one goes. So uh, Teams, let's see what this one does where it's like an actual physical computer. And that one is going to be now. Oh, wait, that's the new client. <laughs> that's the consumer client. That was wrong. Teams. There it is. Work preview. We're going to stop, reset, and click. There we go. So, yeah, that was that was five seconds on that one <laughs> to, to load up from a cold boot. So All that's right. pretty good. So let's bring mine up then. Let's try it there. Oh, yeah, through Parallels. All right, so this is in Parallels. Um, it's already there. <laughs> <laughs> on a, what, M1 Max? Yeah. That's, what you're yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> so, yeah, on a, on a two-, three-year-old Dell, it's like five seconds. That's pretty dang good, too. Um, yeah, awesome. Okay, so... Um, yeah, the, the other thing before we delve into like the, the individual features and kind of start walking through that table is um, what do the updates look like? So there was a question about that on Reddit because they're like, hey, if I go over here um, to my, um, my thing, if I go over here and I click on settings, there's no like check for updates here anymore. 
If I go into like <laughs> settings right here at the top, you know, I don't see anything about checking for updates. So there was kind of a question about that um, on Reddit. And I think Andy might've brought that up or I'll bring it up over here. Cause I want to give credit where credits due. Um, the, these guys on, on the, uh, the Microsoft team subreddit, they were talking about, it actually gets push notifications instead. So um, if I bring that, that up, I've got a picture of what it looks like. What you're going to see if there's an update available is up at the top right here next to your picture, you'll see a update button that kind of shows. So if I go back to this, it'll be up in this area right here where you have that white space. That's how you'll know there's an update and you don't have to manually update. If you like quit it for some reason or you reboot your computer, the next time you start Microsoft Teams, it'll apply that update that it's waiting for. So you don't really have to manage, you know, checking for updates quite as closely if you don't want to care about that. So that's good to know. Um, Andy, were you showing something on your side? I flipped no, back over I was to pulling, my, pulling in my notebook desktop. to get our checklist okay. set up. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, all right, so I think the big, the big thing to show first is uh, multi-tenant support. That was the thing that you know I'm most excited about. You said you're most excited about Tom, Daryl. They're all talking about it. So um, <laughs> with the multi-tenant support, what we've done is uh, Andy is a, a guest in my MVP tenant, and I also invited Megan Bowen to it as well. So we can kind of show like the flip back and forth. So Andy right now, he's in his own MVP tenant. Yep. Looking at his own stuff. He was in, in collab more, which is my MVP tenant. And you saw how fast that was to flip back and forth. So if you get, you know, a notification, you need to switch to it. That's how fast it was. He just did it right then and there. Um, if I go as Megan, I'm going to flip over to the other tenant and, um, and I'll at mention Andy while he's in his home tenant. And we'll kind of see like, what does that look like with the notification coming in? So if I go into my teams and I'm going to start a new post here and I'm going to at mention Andy in that. So at Andy, oh my gosh, this is the first time in this tenant. So it's like wanting to, uh, to give me advertisements basically about what I can do. So at Andy, I can at mention him and say, uh, ding dong, I'm ringing a doorbell. So if I do that, I post that, then he gets the notification immediately through that unified system. He gets the toast popped up that tells him that he was mentioned in 365 Deep Dive General, which is in another tenant than he's currently in right now. So that's what, what you're showing on screen right there. And you click on it, it actually opens up in a pop-out window and it's a channel, not a, not a one-on-one -on -one chat. It's a channel and he's able to post back without getting out of the flow of work in his home tenant. So like, that's pretty powerful. Um, I think that's really nice. Yeah. And he just posted a gift back. I'm able to see that. So what gift did you send? Let me click on it. Nice. <laughs> high five <laughs> okay cool so um that's that now can you show the the uh activity bell at the top and and see if it like pulled that in from the feed so that's going to be your home tenant feed right but if you go to the top right next to the tenant name you're going to notice that there's a little person with a bell icon so if i switch over to my my view because I can zoom in up here. You can see that little icon, a person with a bell that is going to be your activity in other organizations that are not your home one. So that, that toast notification that he had pop in other chats and notifications you get from these other tenants, they're going to stack up in this section in kind of their own little area separate from your home activity feed, if that makes sense. So um, that's the thing there. And then also Tom just pointed out a good way to visually see where you are in the world 
is that top corner. It will show the tenant name that you're currently in. So right now I'm in collab more. My home tenant is Contoso. So when I switch to Contoso, you see it, uh, it'll pop in here up at the top. It's logging in as Megan. There's Contoso. So you can kind of visually see where you are in the world and see, mm -hmm. I've got an activity bell at the top. And that's because I was mentioned in this other channel and then I flipped away from it. So it's, it's in the other account. Tom was also pointing out, let me pull the, um, the message up here, but he's also pointing out, let me go to my screen. Um, so up here we can see like, you know, I was pointing out the, the bell icon where we were. Um, and that's my Andy tenant right over here. But if you look down here, it's telling me that this is coming from collab more. So it even tells me in the pop-up window where mm -hmm. that activity is, uh, is associated with. So at a glance, we know it's not in the tenant that I'm normally in. Yeah. Yep. So that's good to know. And then Tom also said, it sounds like Tom has used this a lot so far. He's like right in there. Um, that, that pop-up, you know, pop-out window applies also to meeting chats. So you, you can get those across the tenant, no matter like where you're at. I, I just, I'm really excited, honestly. Like I know we're like nerding out about something that shouldn't be a big deal because <laughs> this is like, it should have always been this easy, but I'm kind of <clears throat> geeked out about the fact that like, I, I hopefully won't have to care what state I'm in anymore. You know, that, like that's, that's been a big hurdle that I've dealt with for like four years. <laughs> you know? So let's, so. let's just briefly geek out on that just a little bit so we've been on the mobile client for a while and the mobile client whether you're on ios or android has supported multi-tenant environments and multi-tenant switching so that's mm -hmm. that's been there for a while but i think microsoft's thinking with this and with just microsoft 365 tenants as a whole they were walled gardens that's how they were originally designed. Like, and this goes back to Teams development in 2016, but this goes back to like just the Office 365 online environment, you know, 10 years ago. They were designed as as walled gardens for you and your information. They had that mm -hmm. security um, boundary and they did not anticipate that organizations were going to want to work cross tenants that just wasn't the the architecture that they were envisioning uh, at the time things have changed over over the years and now they're realizing that organizations through things like mergers acquisitions and even um uh, uh, divestors that's the right word um are are, are needing flexibility. It's not cost effective for organizations to migrate their content out of one tenant to another every time a new um, organization is uh, acquired or um, two companies come mm -hmm. together. It's 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 a big lift and shift to do that. And the point I'm getting at is we are now entering in a world where I think we're going to see more organizations that are multi-tenant. So you might have like a prime kind of home tenant, and then you might have satellite mm -hmm. tenants to go along with that. For those of you that are familiar with SharePoint hub sites, it's going to be, I think, kind of a similar thing. Like your tenant's now associated with this other tenant, and that's the home tenant, and now we're a big, happy organization. Oh, acquisition, we're going to get spun off onto this other, other company over here. Okay, so change our association. And so... With some of what I think they're doing with teams now is it's it's catching up to some of what the real world scenario is that we work in more than one environment. We work in more than one tenant. You and I and some others here mm -hmm. that are joining us today, we participate in Microsoft calls. So we, we join the Microsoft tenant either through the MVP community or through the um, partner programs that, that they have. So we have to switch over there and we have to do some work. But like yeah. our, our day to day, we're working in multi-tenant environments. I know my organization is um, now um, three companies merged together over the last year and a half and going through all the ins and outs of trying to do guest access and B2B and share channels and multi-tenant collaboration. Like I think this is this is here to stay. So 
they've yeah. addressed it. <laughs> it's just taken a little while to figure out some of that architecture and the way to make this work. But I'll tell you what I've seen so far and what we've tested and like, you know, what I've what I've seen about this program as it's rolled out in teams. I'm really, really impressed with what they've been able to do. It's just huge leap forward. And I think it's really going to help. Yeah, it's it's been really nice. Um, and geek out <laughs> being able to like just that that unified notification so we were talking about some stuff internally in my day job about like you know um living in two different worlds you know and um this promise of like a unified activity uh, would would have helped a lot of that you know theoretical discussion that we've been having in inside of our organization um now i think to shift gears from the multi-tenant switching to something that is a little bit less earth shattering or exciting well, is something that's going to take more, one an more adaptation. Thing. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Go one ahead. more thing on, on there something else. Yeah. There, yeah. There's one more thing we've got to point out. So what's that? When I was switching from Andy's tenant to your tenant, I was using the mm -hmm. same email address. That's my, mm -hmm. my upskill email address. So I was using that email address to switch back and forth. Mm hmm. I can switch over to a completely separate email address and a completely separate tenant just like that. Like I, mm, this is completely yeah. separate demo tenant. It's not connected to any of the ones that we were just looking at. I'm able to switch over and be completely mm -hmm. logged in as another user. And just like that, yeah. bam. It's the, the internal term for that is what MTMA multi-tenant multi-account mm. as well. So it's not, it's not only guest access. That's really good to point out. Yeah. yeah. So something that is less exciting, in my opinion, is the new channels. <laughs> Whenever you switch over to the new client, you're going to notice the first time I clicked on the Teams tab, it tells me channels got a makeover. So what's up with that? Um, this is something that I think is going to be a good thing, especially if you come from the Yammer world or Facebook or like any of these other kind of community type of platforms where your publisher, the thing that you actually type in is at the top of it rather than the bottom. That's the shift that teams channels is moving to. And, um, you know, not to, to be an apologist for Microsoft, but um, I think once we adapt to this, I think it's probably going to be an okay thing, if not a good thing. Because actually, um, the, the, the fact that it's in a different place gets you from, I'm going from a chat area where I'm, I'm chatting up in the chat you know, menu up here at the top to I'm going to where my communities are or I'm going to where my teams are as they kind of, you know, you're, you're getting out of like the, the chat based thing. You're putting a little bit more thought into it because your audience is a little bit broader in a team's channel. So They've moved that as the the pop up says. They moved it from the top, the bottom, to the top right there. And then on the next little tab here, it also tells you that one benefit is you can pop out a channel conversation now, um, which is something I don't believe we could do before. So if I've got right here at the top, Diego, I want to see that thread in its own little window. I can click pop out conversation right there at the top. And it pops out that particular thread into its own area right there. So I can kind of keep that over to the side. And then I can navigate somewhere else inside of Teams to kind of go back and forth between the windows and kind of craft my response until I get Copilot and I have that just crafted everything for me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the poster at the top now, it's going to take some getting used to. Also, as Tom mentioned here, um, they they by default need a subject so or it's asking for a subject now you can have no subject if you want to you don't have to put a subject but it's kind of encouraging you um who is it i think matt wade is a big fan of this as well as laurie and strant um i've seen them advocate on twitter about every channel message thread should have a subject you know kind of like organize your stuff so that as you're scrolling through, you can, you know, kind of get what the gist of that thread is about. So Microsoft's leaning into that a little bit by saying, hey, we're not going to bury the subject anymore. It's going to be right up front when you start crafting a new top level thread. 
um, in, in training when we mm -hmm. teach people about the posts inside of channels, we always bring it back to a, an email. Like you're trying to move off of maybe email based conversations and bring that conversation into teams into a channel mm -hmm. so that it lives side by side messages, content, and maybe even like meetings. You can do all of that inside of a channel. You can't send an email without a subject line. It should be the same thing here. Like mm -hmm. if you've got a thread of conversation going just like an email, it needs to have a subject line so that people know what they're replying to. I know. I feel like we're going back in time a little bit because like in before the pandemic in like 2018, 2019, when I was teaching Teams classes, I was the same way. I was like, hey, you know, Teams is going to be an email killer and all that. I kind of feel like they're almost like so late to the party on this because like it, when they were attacking the email killer thing, um, that was the time to talk about subjects and make that the default. But yeah, I think that's a, it's encouraging a best practice, which is good. Um, I also, I do like that we've got kind of the expanded format bar right here. So in the old teams client, you had just the basics, but now when you're in a channel, which you're going to put more thought into crafting your, your top level, cause there's a bigger audience, it gives you all of the tools that you need without having to go to the advanced formatting menu. So if you need a block quote for like a code snippet right here, or an actual block quote, if you need to mark the importance a different way, those types of things are available now at the top without having to do another click to get into it, which I think is a, a good thing um, for sure. And then I want to see what's behind here. Okay, so when you hit post, there's the little dropout right there. What that is hiding is your uh, reply moderation. So you're allowing everybody to reply or you can just allow moderators to reply. So that's behind that little fly out right there. And then this little icon next to the post button is what type of post this is. Should just be like a standard post. But if you want to make it an announcement, you don't have to start over. You just convert it to an announcement. And then that gives you like a headline with a background image and that type of stuff. So you don't lose what you were typing in your draft if you're like, oh crap, I want to make this into an announcement instead. So, um, yeah, and you can add, what is that, a horizontal rule? Yeah, horizontal rules, all those kind of more advanced things. Personally, what I would use is like the bullets and the, the numbers more than that. Um, you also got some like formatting and stuff like that. Um, Let's do quick comparison because things, when I first yeah. saw this, the first thing that I thought of with up is down. Number one, I thought of the Pirates of the Caribbean when Jack White, everybody thinks he's going crazy. He's running side to side on the boat and he flips it upside down. Up is down. That was the first thing. Um, but when I saw the actual user interface, it immediately called back to Yammer. And so just briefly, I just want to like pull that up and address that real quick. So like this is, mm -hmm. I'm uh, sorry, Viva Engage. This is Viva Engage in, mm -hmm. in Teams. And wait, there there's some similarities with it, like not all of the, uh, of the same UI, but it's top to bottom, just like Viva Engage um, message. Uh, when you click in, the box automatically expands. They did brand it differently enough that you know you're in Viva Engage versus like mm -hmm. if I were in um, a Teams channel and I go to post, like, you know, I still see all of my teams in the left-hand navigation and I see what's going on over here. But I did want to point that out. There is a There are some similarities when you initially start with kind of like the box just collapse, it expands when you go into it, and then you start typing your message. But they did mm -hmm. differentiate the user interface enough that I know I'm clearly in Viva Engage versus like maybe inside of a team and inside of a channel. And then just to compare that, going to like chat. So when I go in here and like I work with uh, a chat, um, let me just do a new one. This interface is essentially the same. So this one hasn't hasn't been updated and we'll talk more about that in just mm -hmm. a little bit but now we've kind of got the full circle of like all the different places where we might be starting conversations yeah. An another thing that that helps i think with having the publisher up the top is not accidentally starting a new thread when you meant to reply um that was something that that kind of plagued my users over at cerner um when i was teaching the teams class it was the the reply was like right here 
but then the new thread was like just underneath it. And it was almost like you had two chat boxes right next to each other. So I had people that they thought they were replying to a thread, but they were actually creating a whole new thread that they were talking about some context that people didn't follow. So um, I think by separating that a little bit, so your reply is all the way down here. Your new post is up here at the top. I think that will also, you know, have a little bit of like, uh, you know, less false new threads or whatever you want to call it, where, where people are accidentally replying or starting a new thread, whatever they meant to not do. There so were even times when the helps. reply button was actually hid behind the new conversation. You would have to scroll down in order to mm -hmm. find the reply to the thread that you were you were in. So having this separated top and bottom, I think is going to be yeah. a huge benefit to users. I'm going to flip over to the old teams and show you guys what I'm talking about there. So like, it, I think it's pretty clear whenever I, I get it up um, here in like 20 seconds, whenever it shows, uh, what... I'm talking about where people were kind of like stumbling into the wrong box. Um, so if I go into like the teams right here and we're in like the design or general channel and there's like some stuff in there, I guess they did get kind of get away with it um, away from it by having the reply here and the new conversation rather than it being just an open text box. So I did forget about that, but it used to be, that this was all you had was the new conversation was opened and then the reply button next to it. So people would get lost. Um, so I guess it's not quite as big of a risk anymore, but having it physically separated, I guess you're putting more thought into crafting something at the top of the page. So I forgot about that new conversation button. <laughs> it's been a while. And while you load the other thing, I think yeah. it's kind of subtle about this is like, the fact that I'm not having to go and click on the A icon with the paintbrush to open the formatter to get to all the formatting options. I just clicked in the message and all of that's open. That's one less thing that I have to worry about. Why one mm -hmm. less click, like, bam, it's there. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Um, and a train, he had a question about like, or a comment, like I really hope that text editor is improved. Um, I, I know that like, it's improved just in the fact that like the bar is showing all the time, the formatting bar. But um, from what I can see, there's not quite as many, you know, things as like what you'd have in word or something like that. I would say maybe one thing I would like to see would be, you know, I have paragraph heading one, heading two, heading three and monospace, but I don't have just like a font picker, you know? So I'm kind of wondering like, why, why don't they, you know, make it so that you could do more text formatting as far as like, I want, you know, whatever font, e even if it's web based only fonts that, that work that way, people don't have to have the fonts installed on their computer. Um, I think it would be nice to have a little bit more type of options. Um, but you do have like the, uh, the highlighter color, the text itself. So you can have like a colored background in a different color of the text on top of it, strike through, underline, all those types of things are available. I'm curious, uh, A-Train in the chat, if you've got something that you're missing, the only thing I could think of is maybe like font choice. Um, so, yeah. And then there was a question in here also about like, why isn't Loop showing up? Um, Tom answered it, but yeah, Loop isn't showing up inside of here yet because it's not available in channels, um, but I, I think I missed that. He said that it was in the uh, co-pilot announcement video. There was some sizzle reel section about having a loop component in a channel. So hopefully that means it's coming somewhat soon. In the fall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, A-Train says, hey, whenever I'm adding a new message, adding a bullet would sometimes send the message. Dude, I've done that too, where I'm like, okay, should I do like a shift enter or actually just enter right here? So if I'm typing in the publisher right here, you know, hey, everyone, here is some bullets. Like in the past, what you've done is then you would like do like a shift enter to kind of like add more lines or you would like do a shift enter, add a bullet, and then you just be able to hit enter. It adds a new bullet to it. 
Um, if I get rid of those bullets, though, and just do in the past, if you would hit enter like that, it would have sent the message. But now I'm able to just hit enter with a single finger, and I don't accidentally post until I click the button for post. So, yes, uh, it looks like you're not going to accidentally post. Now, to be fair, in the old teams, the current version teams, um, if you got into that extra formatting, it's like the little A with a pencil icon, it switched to this behavior. So in that one, um, I don't think you would accidentally post either, but because this is the default, you by default aren't accidentally posting. So hopefully that helps um, with that question that came up. We had a great question uh, in the chat. Let me pull it up real quick. Um, mm -hmm. I was also talking about keyboard shortcuts. So I'll test that while you're pulling up um, the other thing. So here is some bold, italic, underline text. So if I double click on bold and do command B. Oh, wait, I'm on a Windows. Control B, <laughs> control I, italics. And control U, so the the keyboard shortcuts do work, um, A train. So hopefully that helps um, with that. I was able to do those. What is strike through? Like I don't I don't know if there's a shortcut for. Nope, that's capture uh, for strike through. <laughs> I'm trying to hover over it, but I don't see. So at least you can do those three. That's cool. So what were you gonna bring up? Oh, uh, so Give me a flip to you. Yeah, um, John had oh, a question sorry. about the memory footprint. So let me bring that up. So this is um, the memory okay. footprint currently running on um, on mine. Now, full disclosure, um, just in case you're tuning in late, uh, I am on a um, Mac M1 uh, ARM chip, the M1 Max, mm -hmm. and I'm running Parallels. But it's currently only consuming uh, 600 megs of memory on mm -hmm. my uh, on my machine okay yeah i'm looking at mine right now as well uh so there's microsoft teams it's kind of jumping around um mine is using 412 megabytes of ram um and it's using 0.1 percent cpu let me sort by name instead of cpu so i know that there's not I think the other thing that's an improvement, yeah, I don't see like all the others, is it's, okay, well, it, it does still have a whole lot of processes. <laughs> so you do see all these ones that are called Web ed, uh, WebView 2. Um, so that kind of adds up to all of it. So um, the biggest one is whatever this WebView 2 module is or process is using 300 of that 400 meg. Um, this is also to say, as we get into a meeting and we do a test meeting, um, we'll probably see that come up, right? Because we're doing audio and video and things like that. So, um, but yeah, it's, it seems to be okay. You know, I mean, half a gig is fine if you're running like a 32 gig laptop, you know, something like that. Um, honestly, I, there's not a whole lot of like four gig laptops out there now. So yeah, seems a little bit better. Um, what's, what's the next thing here on known issues on our list of stuff to talk about? Okay. Yeah. So some of the known issues that we've got, if I bring up, um, that thing right here, there's a big list that, um, I'll put in the chat right now for this. There you go. And that is, um, the known issues for the Teams 2.0 client. It's it's in their their big document about like how to roll it out, what the prereqs are, all of that type of stuff. So if I go in here, um, the known issues section, there's some general ones like presence, uh, stuff like that, some accessibility. That's just kind of generic that like there might be some gaps, but they don't call anything out specific. Um, we've got a few things that, that we kind of think are like heavy hitters uh, for what we care about. But um, some of the things that are, are big for me is if you're screen sharing or you're in do not disturb, this is mentioned in a couple of those headers, uh, the toast notifications 
pop up for you. So that's something to definitely keep in mind. If you go into screen sharing, automatically you should go into do not disturb or presenting mode. Be aware that sometimes toast notifications pop up. So we're kind of back to the Skype days of like, you know, somebody sends just like a period or a you there because they don't want to send an embarrassing thing while you're presenting. Um, be careful about that. I haven't seen this personally, but there's also a uh, blank pop up pop outs. So people like clicking on a chat notification, it comes up with a blank window. Um, I think I've seen in the, in the notes, if I do like blank, it's uh, for a few moments. I think it's like, basically it's blank for a little bit, but then it, it paints in the rest of the chat. So, you know, that's, that's that. Um, also people have reported or they've, they've got a known issue around poor screen sharing resolution. So you might notice when somebody shares their screen, it's a little bit more pixelated than it would have been. Um, they, they've get, they say in there that, uh, that's something they're actively working to fix. Um, the accidental leaving. So whenever you go to leave a meeting, it will ask if you're sure, like whenever, I know on a Mac it does this if I hit like Command W. So if you hit the shortcut to like close a window from your keyboard and it it tries to close the meeting, it will say, whoa, whoa, you're in a meeting. Are you sure you want to leave the meeting? And then you say, oh, thank goodness. And you hit X and you don't leave the meeting. Um, apparently with Teams 2.0 or 2.1, um, it will just leave the meeting without asking you. So be aware of that if you're using your keyboard shortcuts. Um, the mute and camera enablement. So whenever you're in a meeting, let me just launch a meeting real quick. <clears throat> whenever you're in the meeting and you've got like the mute icon or the, the camera toggle, apparently that can show sometimes as enabled when you're actually muted. So um, you'll, you'll probably see like down in the corner for yourself that you're not muted, but that's something to, to think about there. So let me just get into a meeting and kind of look at a couple of these real quick. Okay, so this is going to be hard because I don't have a microphone on this one apparently. But there's Megan Bowen. She's talking. I'm doing um, – by the way, I use OBS for this, like a fake video loop type thing. But apparently whenever you toggle that back and forth, sometimes it can show that it's enabled when it's actually truly disabled. So that's something um, to think about. And then if I go in here and I hit control W, see, it just closed the meeting out. It didn't uh, say, are you sure you want to close? So that kind of illustrates this previous one of accidentally leaving. Um, I didn't get the whole like enablement thing to be able to show. I don't know if you have that or not, um, Andy, in yours. And then apparently there's a presence mismatch sometimes too, where it'll show you as available when you're actually not available, things like that. What did Tom say here? I love leaving meetings. <laughs> <laughs> now what I do is I don't, you know, use a keyboard shortcut for that. I use my stream deck and I've got that big, you know, nuclear option, the big phone icon to just leave the meeting. Um, I'm going to wear that button out <laughs> by leaving meetings. With my stream deck, so, so um, other things you want to point out, out Andy? There. Yeah, just a, just Go ahead. a leaving meeting question. Do you mute, turn off your camera, and then leave, or do you just leave? I'm just curious. Like, put it in the chat. I'm I'm just kind of curious to see how people how people leave meetings. Do you shut now down? I'm curious. And then... Like now, I can't imagine what. That's so do you just hit the like... leave button? And then go, or do you turn off your camera and then and your yeah, mic and then leave? It's like asking, um, you know, do you put your toilet paper on the roll going over <laughs> or under? Well, there's or a saying, right and a like, wrong answer there. You, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is definitely. <laughs> my my wife hasn't hasn't gotten it right yet. <laughs> I always switch it. Um, the uh, the other thing is like it's it's like do you put both socks on and then your shoes, or do you put one sock and then the shoe and the other sock and then the shoe? <laughs> <laughs> supposedly Somebody people says, put their uh, pants on one leg at a time <laughs> yeah oh that's another thing i heard on a podcast is um a life hack apparently is um 
put your belt on your pants before you put your pants on. Apparently it's like life changing. Like if you got a new pair of pants and your belt, most people like I put my pants on and then I like thread my belt through. Apparently like some guys like it's way easier to loop all of your belt on and then put your pants on. So you don't miss any belt loops. Um, I'd never heard of that before, but (laughs) apparently that's a life hack. So, so as we're talking about this, I can't help but think like, have you ever tried to dress a toddler? Because the more that you can stack up <laughs> and get done at one time, the more, true. the, the yeah. higher your success rate is going to be. Cause there's sometimes you get one sock on and then they're gone and then you got to yeah. wrestle them and it's like trying to dress an alligator. Yeah. You get the next layer like half on and they wiggled <laughs> out of the one you just did. Um, <laughs> people are saying like, I just leave. I tend to click, just leave um john says you know he doesn't really have his camera on most of the time um tom says he switches to the new avatar avatar and then he leaves without explanation <laughs> <laughs> so he transforms into the metaverse and then just leaves so what we need is a stream deck action that automatically converts <laughs> us to an avatar does the dab and then yeah. exit us out of the out of the meeting yeah <laughs> I do the avatar too uh, in some meetings, Tom. Um, usually it's it's so disruptive that like it's the first five minutes of the meeting when you join and shock everybody. But no, yeah, I'm one that it. I just leave the meeting. Do you like mute and kind of like get out of the meeting that way or do you just hit leave? I so I'm really paranoid about the camera staying on and like you know having a zoom bomb like way back in in the day. So like I I typically make sure like my at least my camera's deactivated before I leave the meeting. Okay, and that's just so you don't accidentally have it on in the next yeah. meeting because that's yep. the default. Oh, okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah, it, I've it, never it, heard just, of somebody being worried about that. Um, <laughs> I have so many cameras around me; it's ridiculous. Like that's in my true. line of sight, I have I have six. I have seven or eight yeah. cameras immediately around me i know i've like, got like three facing me right now and yeah. then i've got a stack of mtrs behind me <laughs> that are all cameras without oh, you, brought, you know that's, there's eight i've got yeah i've got a i've got an mtr in there i've got three yeah. webcams that i'm testing slash content cameras i've got an <laughs> mtr i've got oh that's nine my laptop i both work laptops have cameras built in. One monitor has a camera built in, and then I have my fancy cameras. Yeah, I've got yeah. one one bar that that I don't think I can show right yet. <laughs> it has it has four camera lenses on it that are looking at me right now. So yeah, like you on that me, one Darryl. thing, there's four. <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah, it's like the Truman Show in Andy's office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I just uh, I, I make sure the camera turns off before I, I head over or, or head out and go to to the next one. Yeah, yeah. this is a good question. Like, um, is there a team certified camera with a team's button yet? Um, I don't know about a standalone camera necessarily. There's like the Microsoft camera, the Brio. They don't have teams buttons on them, um, but there are those. Uh, those displays the team's displays that are kind of forthcoming like let me show one of them here um this is going to be like maybe way overkill for you but uh the yeah link a24 um that's what's on my desk i'm looking at right now it is a beautiful device i love this thing but that's one where it's a whole monitor with the camera built into it at the top and it has a team's button and you you click the camera button it goes up and down outside of the the top of this it's also got a wireless charger on it uh, microphone toggle it, the bottom is a speaker and a wireless charger um, it also you know doubles as like a dock for your laptop charges your laptop all that cool stuff it's also a whiteboard so it's got a touch screen for drawing um, but that one that's I mean a camera that has a teams button it's kind of all in one in a station uh, the this one was just newly team certified. Uh, there's also a Dell conference monitor that I know of. It's not a Teams display, so it doesn't have its own Android OS on it. But there's monitors. I think there's three sizes. John Ernst would know in the chat because we actually validated them together. Um, and uh, it's got a, mo- a speaker, microphone, uh, camera, and a Teams button on it. Uh, let me look it up. Dell conference monitor teams. There was like a 24, a 27 and a 
34 inch version of those. And here's, here's what it looks like. So it's got the teams button and like the volume and, and microphone. This whole bottom section here is the speaker. And then it's got this nice, I think it's windows. Hello certified. Maybe that you can pop up and down. Um, this one does not run its own operating system. So it, you like you connect your laptop over USB C and then it powers your laptop. And that way you don't have another OS to manage like you would with the yeah link. Um, this is a standalone device or it could be used in peripheral mode. So I don't, I don't know if that's uh, along the lines of what you were asking, but it might be uh, something that you could check out um, if you've got money to burn. I, I love the yeah link one. It's super cool. So um, the one that was on screen, Tom, the, the, that was the Dell monitor. The one that's like you could pull it down and whiteboard. That's by Yeah Link. It's an A23. So, yeah, John, if you're if you remember, if you know the model number on those Dells, let let him know. <laughs> I remember that like we had them on our desks at Cerner because we were testing them out uh, for executive offices and stuff. So, um, um, the roadmap. Yeah, I think that covers like some of the known issues, and yeah. we've separated out what's a known issue from what's missing. Um, it's important to say that because I think people might be thinking in their mind, like they're glossing over like a ton of stuff that's not in the team's client. We're going to get to what's missing and what our recommendation is. But um, as far as the known issues, that's the stuff that's broken. That gives you a little bit of a list and there's a, a link in the chat. We could probably post that again for you. Um, the roadmap though, what is coming that we know about specifically the first one for me that, that I'm excited about, Mac support, obviously. So Mac, uh, VDI, uh, the EDU type of tenants, and the web-based client, those are all things that are coming later. Um, I think, Andy, you said that there was a blog somewhere. They said they're targeting fall for some of these options. I believe so. The... Yeah, hopefully maybe some of them. I don't know specifically uh, any dates for these. Uh, I, I kind of personally just to set my own expectations i'm not holding my breath to see any of these other ones before probably the end of the year but um i i would like to have high hopes low expectations when it comes to microsoft delivery dates um so those are coming also this is not available yet in gcc gcc high or dod so those like secure clouds um i mean they're all secure but like the government clouds they're not available there yet as well. Um, Tom's adding some some details. Says, yeah, when when he says VDI, this means that you cannot run this in Windows 365. So if you're a Windows 365 user, that that's along the lines of VDI as well. Um, also, the EDU tenant. He says he has some EDU tenants. Um, not sure what he means by that. It affects A plans. Our E users have it so it depends e on your licensing E3, level E5 yeah like if A1. you're e3 yeah. e5 yes you can use the new teams if you're you know a1 a3 whatever the a ones are then you don't have the new teams yet so you wouldn't be able to turn it on for your organization um daryl said he saw some some partial mac support the last couple of weeks and then it disappeared so and we should also yeah, note that would be cool and hopefully we've emphasized this enough, but what's being worked on web platforms, this, this mm -hmm. is just the desktop client. This is not in the web. The web is still classic. The web has not been updated. This is yeah. strictly the desktop client. Yeah. If you flip the switch up here, that does not affect teams.microsoft.com for you. Um, that only is going to install affect this install on this windows computer. So yeah, that's important to point out. Um, some of the other advanced calling features. So if you're a type of person who does like call queues, like you're in a call center, you, the new teams is not for you because there's no call center support yet. Um, also some of the advanced meeting features. Um, we haven't, we, we didn't get into the meeting too deep, but you can't manage background or back breakout rooms. That's what I meant. You can't manage your breakout rooms. I think also, like some of the video filters, camera filters aren't available yet in the new teams, stuff like that. Um, they're also talking about seven by seven video. So it used to be called the large gallery, but when you've got 49 people up on screen, 
it's not available. So that would that would mean what, Andy? That it maxes out at like twelve people, or something? Doesn't it like go from twelve to large gallery mode? I can't seven remember. Seven. Something we'll get like that. that. In it's either nine, nine or twelve, um, rather than forty nine people. I would imagine also that paging might not be there when you can like kind of page through the gallery. I've heard that that's uh, something that rolled out. Um, this is a big one, in my opinion. If you're a person who manages Microsoft Teams, um, then the channel creation and team creation, as well as cross-posting. So if you're a type of person who's like, your job is to make the teams for your group, um, you're, you're not going to be ready yet, or you're going to use that web version. So you can like make the new channels, and you can add tabs and all that type of stuff. So... Some of those third-party apps, the line of business apps, the channel creation, that's where I think most people probably are going to have hangups is with just like managing Microsoft Teams and managing those chats. Um, also, search inside of a chat or channel is not available. So I can search up at the top here. So like if I search for, I don't know, like marketing or something, um, I can search across all of Teams, right? And that's going to find messages and people and files. That that works fine. But what they mean is when you do like the control F, right? So in the old Teams client, say I'm in this particular thread and I want to search for like manage, I would do control F and it would pop up to be able to search just this one thread. You can't do that in the new Teams client yet. So you can search across everything, but not in a specific one. Um yeah, but there is a lot of things that are available. So like the new channel experience, being able to do multi-account, multi-tenant, um, the Microsoft application. So like approvals, things like that. Viva Engage, that's available in the new teams, but not those third-party applications. I haven't seen yet, is avatars available uh, in the new teams? It doesn't look like it is. No. <clears throat> because I can't install new applications and avatars isn't here in I'm in public preview right now. Um, that's something to keep in mind too. You can't use your avatar in uh, the new teams yet. So, so cool. with that, let's go into the feature parity because there's mm -hmm. way we did it kind of high level moving through there, but there are a lot of features that yeah we we've got more mention. specific things on the list here. Yeah, so I'm going to make this a little bit wider maybe um so just from the top down to the bottom the whole adding channels tabs and members things like that so if i go into my microsoft team and i go in here i can just manage the team but you notice that like that menu is really short right i can't i can see who the members are i can see who the admins are and i can even switch them from a member to an owner but i'm not able to add new members or new owners to this particular team. So you would want to toggle off for that, switch back to the old client or use the web. Same thing with channels. If I go into the channels, I can see what they are and I can do the management so I can get into the settings, some of the settings, but I can't add a new channel to this team. So I can only basically do the tags and the general settings for the team. So that's something that's, that's missing. Um, I think that's fairly important for some people. So the key the takeaway, you apps. can participate in the channel, but you just can't add the new channels or add people to it. You can't manage it. So we can participate. And I think that's going to be a running theme. We're going to be able to participate in certain things, but some of the management setting capabilities are just not there yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the ability to the app management stuff. So, I showed that like you can't go add new apps. That's missing from the bottom down here. I also don't have a search at the top to search the app store and add the avatars app. Um, so you can't do that. Also, um, pinning and rearranging. Like I'm right clicking right now. I can't right click and remove. Like I usually remove the calls feature. I can't remove that. I also cannot. I'm clicking and dragging. I can't rearrange those either. And I can't like promote shifts to my menu so basically you're locked into this menu and only this menu um hey, so, so that's uh, something to think about go back to your screen for a second yeah all right uh, up at the top teams and then you got your meatball menu um filter and then the plus sign 
There's your okay, new toy yeah. taste button. Yeah, Tom was pointing that out, wasn't he? Yeah, there we go. So the plus button up here at the top, that's where create a team would be. And it even has the sample text right there, create or join. Um, only joining is available right now. You can't create yet. So that's that. Um, you can still search for your teams and channels. Uh, broken app icons. I don't have any any broken icons, but apparently that's one of the known issues is that you might have some icons that don't load for your applications. So keep an eye out for that. Um, it's also probably important to, to note that um, is to give feedback on this type of stuff. Like if you have a broken app icon or you see something, I, I would recommend go to help and do give feedback so you can get that back to Microsoft. What did you run into? You know, that type of stuff. You're in public preview, so you're kind of in a test ring by running this version of Teams. Give feedback, you know, do your part. So I would I would recommend that if you run into any of these broken things. It would um, be cool if they were to link copilot to the feedback button. So I could just say, hey, copilot, give feedback because this is broken. And like copilot handle it for me and then send yeah. the feedback in. Or like the the shake on the phone. <laughs> I'm gonna shake my laptop man i can't tell you how many times i put my phone in my pocket and it's not asleep yet or it's not or, or i haven't uh -huh. hit the button and then when i pull it back out of my pocket it's like feedback and i'm like oh cancel and then i have to cancel like 20 times because it's been in my pocket as i'm yeah. been walking <laughs> <laughs> so in the chat um there's there's a couple things that are missing that you know it's not a ton but searching for external people, this is even if you're federated with them and you're looking for their email address, that's missing. So you can't start a new chat with an external person. You're going to need to flip to the old teams, go find that person, start talking to them. Then you can flip to the new teams. Um, also at mentioning everyone. So I want to test this out and see what it looks like. Um, if I go into like this general tab and there's multiple people in here, and I start a new post. You, you saw earlier I was able to at mention Andy. And I can at mention people specifically, but I can't do at everyone. Um, can I do at team? No, that's not a thing. So I tabbed off of it. Can you do the name okay, of the team? So it yeah. did recommend it whenever, uh, probably because the word team is in it. Yeah. If I do at Mark 8, it does do that. And if I do at channel, so like at general... If I do add general, I can mention the channel. I can mention the name of the team. Let me go to, so virtual coffee shop. The word team is not in here. Um, basically, it looks like you can't do those variables. So if I do like at team, okay, it did, it did come up with that option. At channel. So it did offer... Because of the type is a channel, I guess it, it did come up in search um, at all. No, at everyone. But it looks like it's just the everyone uh, thing. You can't do that. Now in a chat, what can I do with a chat here? This is my daily standup. I should be able to at mention Alex, right? Like that shows up. Um, but a new feature that was in the old teams is you could add everyone in a group chat and it would notify everybody that's not available yet in the new teams. So do you have any of your users organized by tags or um, tagged? I do not. I don't think. Um, let me, let me check that. So let's manage tags <clears throat> and let's add a tag. So we're going to do the cool people and we're going to add Alex he's pretty cool and megan she's pretty cool so we got those people as a tag the cool people and then there's like 16 other people in here so can i mention the tag subject at cool cool people so it does let you do tags so that's nice um yeah other things to test with that you can think of? Those were the, the, the main one, the being able to at mention the team, at mention the channel, and then the tags. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, now, when we get down to meetings, there's a lot <laughs> for the meeting stuff. 
Um, one is the the HID controls or the HID controls. Um, this is going to affect your team's devices. So that's going to be um, actually, I, I don't know if it does like proper team certified devices, but if you have like a microphone that has a mute button on it and it controls it like through a HID control, like a keyboard type of control, those don't work. So that's your things like being able to mute the, those types of deals. Um, also what's missing, you know, some of us are really excited about stream deck. There's no API key uh, in the new version. So if I go over here to settings, um, it was, it was under devices, right? Privacy. That's where the AP guy was. I believe it was privacy. In privacy. Okay. It was in privacy. Um, there's no API section right now. So stream deck support, I don't believe is there. Um, and that's also your other hid controls for like mute and stuff like that. So keep that in mind. I think that's a pretty big deal. Um, but some the, shortcuts work. Yeah, yeah, those keyboard shortcuts. So like, what is that? Control <laughs> Shift M or something like yeah. that for muting. Yeah, those so you can work, still so. you can still program like hotkeys in your Stream Deck and use mm -hmm. keyboard shortcuts for some of the stuff. But like the recently released, if you have the window active, you know, yeah, yeah, um, that that's kind of a a killer for me, kind of a showstopper for me because I <laughs> I live by my Stream Deck when I'm in meetings now. Is that like going back um, to the Stone Ages for you, John? It feels like it, yes. Uh, <laughs> scheduling. So what if do you, you mean do some I have advanced to push the button scheduling, manually? Yeah, right, like a caveman. Um, you use your if you hands. do advanced things with scheduling, like forwarding or setting like, I want to schedule this in the team's calendar, I don't know why you would, and show as free or something like that, um, as well as categories. Some of those are not available. So if I go to like schedule a new meeting, <clears throat> Let's just see what we've got available for us. See, I I see that. So maybe this is an update. Like if I'm going to make this out of office and say Megan's PTO and I want to make it like an orange category, it, it appears that the category, that stuff is working. And then if I add like Alex, because I want to be mean to him and do that, I can set it as all day. So I guess I can do that. Also, response options, I cannot request or not allow forwarding. It's like, let's send that. And it popped up. So it is orange. And it's marked as out of office because you can kind of see like the little sliver of the ribbon. So I, I don't really know what they're saying about that. Um, if I go on here, I'm not seeing that I can forward any meetings but i can like so yeah see so here's one that i'm invited to um well no because that's a cancel i can change the show as i can change the category so it looks like those things are available i kind of think maybe oh here we go so accept decline um this is one i was invited to i can't forward the invite but i don't remember if i could do that on the old teams client because i never really used those features with the calendar. So maybe your mileage might vary as far as the advanced scheduling. It looks like I can do a webinar. I can not allow forwarding all those types of things. So maybe that's an update just since they posted that article. Um, managing breakout rooms. So when you're in a meeting, so like I scheduled that meeting with Alex, I'm going to go edit that meeting. Um, up here at the top, let's look at the tabs that, that open up for me. So I've got like the Q and a, the assistant, stuff like that. I do not have breakout rooms available in this tab. Um, and if we join the meeting here, <clears throat> then let's go into the meeting and see what breakout room options are available. So as it loaded in all these other things, I don't have the apps button. I also don't have um, anything about breakout rooms in here, uh, which it, not having the apps section also means that I won't be able to um, add a poll in the in the meeting. So that's kind of an important thing for, for a lot of people. If I go into the meeting options, let's see what I can change in the meeting while we're in here. Um, so I want to see, can I turn on Q and a, cause that's almost quasi an app. So let's do that. 
and Q and a is unavailable in the new team. So because it adds it as a meeting app, you can't do that. So it looks like basically all meeting apps are kind of out of the, out of the picture right now. Um, stay tuned. So no breakout room stuff. That's kind of a bummer. Um, share and collaborate on a whiteboard. So if I go in here and I hit share, I can share my screen. I can share a window. I can also share PowerPoint live, but you'll notice there's no whiteboard option here. So you can't share a whiteboard. You can't create or, you know, pick an existing whiteboard. Um, also, I don't see Excel live here. I don't think that was mentioned in the list, but I don't see Excel live either. Um, so yeah, another, another bummer there. Cause I've been using whiteboard more and more in meetings lately. Excel live, not available previewing your video settings. So if I go in here and I'm going to like go into devices, so I'm in the meeting, hit device settings. And then I turn on like that camera view. I can't preview that. Let me leave and rejoin this meeting. See if I can do that from the join screen. So I'm not in the meeting yet. I'm going to turn on my camera. And okay, so I can see Megan before joining the meeting, which is the most important, in my opinion. Um, I can change the background on her. So there's a different background for her. That works good. I can open up the, the settings cog. I can adjust brightness. I can turn on soft focus, those types of things. So those are available. It just looks like you can't preview yourself in the meeting. I wonder if what they're talking about is when you hover the over camera the camera option. Yeah. So like yeah. whenever you hover over and just like, don't touch it. Yeah. Usually it comes up with a little picture and picture window and yep. shows you a preview of your camera. So I think that's what they're talking about is you don't see your camera until you boom, you turn it on. So be aware of that. Um, hey, before you, um, yeah, go in like do the uh, go into a presenter mode. Okay. Yeah. So let's share my screen here in the meeting, like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm sharing. I'm you know in a normal Teams view, but you notice like I didn't have any options, and I don't have that like control bar at the very top of my window that would be up here. That's not available for me. Um, if I open this back up, Windows recently set you to do not disturb. You may have missed. Okay, whatever. So, um, yeah, I I don't have the ability to go into one of those presenter modes. Those would be like up here in this area. The presenter toolbar and then the various presenter modes that would be available through it. Yeah, and that's not available at all, the presenter toolbar. Yep. That's what they call it. Um, so... Both of these are not available, which means you don't have presenter mode. It also means that you don't have annotations because the way that you annotate in your screen in a meeting is by clicking the pencil icon in the, the presenter bar. So because you don't have that, you won't be able to do annotation powered by whiteboard. So keep that in mind. Um, that's another kind of a big deal, especially if you're doing, you know, um, like, design sessions right you want to mark up a design with annotations uh you won't be using the new teams for that yet um so this is a good place to brief segue um yeah daryl asked, uh, no asked desk this presenter. question yesterday um mm -hmm. he asked on the on the mac if there was an equivalent mm -hmm. for the zoom it tool on windows to be able to like zoom into a, a certain part of a screen and mm -hmm. to be able to annotate for those of you that are Windows users, what's your annotation slash Zoom to a, a tool of choice? And then for those of you on the Mac, what's your presentation annotation tool of choice? Mm -hmm. I know John and I both use uh, Presentify, and then John, you've got a, another cursor tool. Yeah, there was a question from I think A Train on the like, what? Do, how are you highlighting <clears throat> your cursor? Yeah, I use something called Cursor Pro for mine, so I can like highlight and I can zoom in. I'm I'm hitting my Control key on my keyboard to basically zoom in like a magnifying glass. Um, if I open up the presentify right here, um, that's going to activate that toolbar. I don't, well, where's it at? I don't think I'm running presentify. Let me open that up first. Um, is it 
Okay, there we go. So I opened that up and that brings this little toolbar. Dang it. Is it not going to work? So I'm doing that, but not over on this monitor. I got to like change the setting, I guess. Let me, let me fix this real quick here. <clears throat> I got Presentify up. I'll bring it up. Okay. Yeah. Why don't yeah. you bring it up? So, yeah, so like what, what Andy's doing now is using a third party application called Presentify to annotate his screen. Now you have more options than the team's an uh, annotations by doing this. But the big thing you're missing by doing this is collaborative annotations. You know, with the team's annotations, you can let other people write on your screen. With this one, you, you can't. You're basically the person in charge. So Tom says he uses Zoomit um, or Windows++ Plus Plus if he's not allowed to install other things. Um, so yeah, that's something you might have to go to like a third party app if you want to like mark up your screen or like highlight your cursor. Another thing I use on the Mac is, um, yeah, let me bring that up. It's, it's not going to look very pretty, but another thing I use is something called, um, what's it called here? Mirror magnet. Um, so that's another application I use to do like picture in picture. So if I turn on my camera, I want to select like the cam link. And then I want it to be like in the lower corner down here. I have that this app that I use and I have a button that turns it on and off. So I can kind of do like it's the equivalent of the standout mode. And what's, what I like about it is if I move my cursor down there, it dims it. So you can see what I'm pointing at on my cursor. So basically saying like if you need presenter modes and annotation and you want to use the new teams, look at some third party options We're we're getting back to like being creative again, like we were before we had these first party tools. So anything else to add about those two, Andy? No, I just wanted to bring that up because uh, that, okay. that conversation with Daryl was fresh in my mind, um, especially okay, anything cool. related to annotation or whiteboarding. Yeah. There are some tools out there that allow you to do some of that. Yeah. So presentify is that, that annotation tool and it will highlight your cursor too. You can choose to, to let it highlight your cursor. Um, what I personally use is cursor pro and that's just because like I have a lot more options um, and the magnifying glass. So th that's why I use two applications for mine. Um, the attendance report. So you can't view the attendance report like inline, but you can download the attendance report. So if I go up here to attendance at the top, I'm not going to get quite as nice of, um, you know, a table. Well, no, I do. So I don't know what they're talking about here either. This might be something that's dated also because I've got the table where I can like scroll through and I can see how long the person was in and I can download that. So maybe this is dated. Can you toggle the date drop down in the upper left hand corner? Yeah, so it looks like it will support a series as well. Yeah, it looks like it'll support a recurring meeting. Yeah. So I think maybe we can scratch that one off the list. Um, yeah, let's let's scratch that one off the list. And then what was the other one? The scheduling stuff. Mm -hmm. I think maybe those are already better for us. So that's good. Um, they did make an update on the 12th to the roadmap. Okay, good. So call health. This is another one. It says that you can't call, you can't use call health. So let's see if we have that available to us. I think it's in settings, isn't it? No, I do not have that. So um, that's another thing, the, the kind of like live call health where it shows like your resolution, your bit rate, all that type of stuff. That's not um, in there. But so, how am I going to complain if I can't check my call health? Yeah. So I... I'm curious if anybody in the chat uses call health <laughs> today. I don't ever use it. Uh, We've personally. actually had to use it a lot recently. But, we had, yeah. um, I don't positions. do like support tickets, so I don't really yeah. have to pay attention too much. So half my, half my role is supporting teams, meeting devices and video conferencing. And we had yeah. some physicians that were having issues with the resolution of some things that they were sharing in teams meetings. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, same computer, same room, same network, and the resolution was just really, really low. But if they were to connect into a Teams meeting device, the resolution went up. And so we had to do a lot of um, network mm-hmm. diagnostics to figure out um, what was going on. And we were able to get some fixes from Microsoft on that. But yeah, we used we used Call Health quite a bit uh, to do some of that troubleshooting. Yeah, it's and a even, helpful tool. Yeah. Even working like remote, just you know, on on the local network that you're on. Um, you know, home router figuring out if there's a bottleneck that maybe if you switch your router to streaming mode might address mm-hmm. the ability to share your desktop versus like if you're um, uh, if the resolution's yeah. low or poor, you know, things like that. So it's been really helpful, but to not have it, mm-hmm. uh, hopefully they'll roll that out or an updated version of it. Yeah. Back to the call or the, the meeting options or like when you're scheduling a meeting, the advanced stuff, Tom was saying, for a while, he had the meeting options when he was setting up a meeting, but then it got yanked away. So I see meeting options right now in this one. Um, let me schedule a new meeting and see if it's available at scheduling time. So let's close out of that. And let's start a new meeting. Um, it may be that what you have to do... Yeah, see, I don't see meeting options like in at scheduling time. So it looks like what you got to do is schedule the meeting, then go click into it and do meeting options, which is um, the the way I've always remembered doing it. Uh, Meeting apps. We already covered that one. So that's your polls, your Q and a meeting options. I think we can take that off the list because I was able to do that during the meeting, Um, but also games for work. This is a a fun, you could do minesweeper, stuff like that. We have um, a, a colleague of mine, good friend, Jason, he's, leaving my organization today so we had like a a fun get together you know to kind of celebrate him and uh you know blow off some steam a little bit we did games for work and we actually uh played some word games and um i highly recommend it it's really cool if you're using the old teams client so not available in the new teams but um games for work check it out if you can i think it's cool camera filters so this is that overlay with the filters and stuff like that I'm in Megan Bowen's meeting here and we're going to go to her device settings. And this is where like the overlays would be. So she can do brightness and soft focus. If I go background effects, this is where the overlays are. Right. And like the new uh, Snapchat filters, I think they're in the background or the video settings, like, I think is what they yeah, changed it to. Yeah, background settings up top, and then I believe it's the yeah video effects down below. Yeah, so we're going back in time a little bit. With that, you only have background settings. You don't have the animated front parts or um, the the filters where you can have you know a bear hugging your neck or whatever. And as we look um, forward, some of the things that are in preview, like the avatars, not there, and then the new um, Snapchat filters that Microsoft's been advertising all week. Mm-hmm. Um, that that one's both forward and backward because immediately, uh, and uh, Daryl and, and um, Daniel were talking about this on their show earlier this week. And yeah. immediately when that they discussed that message in the message center, I'm like, I remember that lawyer who's like, "I'm not a cat." <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, real high value uh, feature there. <laughs> um, Ooh, so hey, hey, before we go on, um, yeah, hey, Tom, something else. Can you means? put the um, the folder location in the chat? Uh, that might be helpful for some people that uh, um, might be interested in that. So uh, there's the background effects there's a certain folder for it and for a while it was kind of a workaround where you would have to go and update you could update them there manually but you couldn't run through the team's client in order to get it they've all fixed mm-hmm. all of that but some of the it pros might yeah. want to know where that folder location because maybe they were is. delivering um, them with seccm or something yeah yeah so i can add a new background it, it did come up with that so that's good But yeah, if you're like doing it programmatically at your organization, it would be helpful to know that folder location. Um, Yeah, if if Tom finds it and puts it in the chat, I'll I'll highlight it for us. And we'll give a Um, virtual. Anything else with meetings that you think of? We cover Um, everything in the list. So we talked like this is about the parity and all the things that are mentioning, but I think it is worth mentioning that the couple of things are happening with this. So if like I'm, I'm in Andy's tenant and 
you've got a meeting scheduled with me and it's in your tenant, it's going to try to auto switch me in that pop-up window to your tenant. So I get the best experience. Mm-hmm. So I get the guest in your tenant versus like the external guest experience from my tenant. So that's yeah. going to be a subtle change for end users. They don't necessarily have to w- uh, worry about switching tenants to join the meeting. It's going to kind of preemptively yeah. do some of that. But that also means that I can join a meeting in that pop-up window and then I can still use the Teams client to maybe stay where I am and you know have a chat or a conversation in mm-hmm. like my main tenant that's while so still cool. participating in like that yeah. uh, that external. So that I'll just kind of show that huge here. So boost. we got Megan. She's in Contoso right now, but in her main Teams client, she's going to flip over to Collab more and start working in a different tenant. Like, how cool is that? <laughs> to to be able to like you know kind of live in both worlds at the same time in a meeting and not that's drop the call really nice yeah and not drop the call during that process like that's awesome to have that i guess another thing i want to check in on while we're well, i've had this meeting running for a while and i'm kind of like pushing my virtual machine why don't we lo- go look back at the uh, processes see what we got going for microsoft teams so now i'm using 566 megabit or megabytes, um, 24% of my CPU for that. And I've got a, f- a couple more, uh, you know, processes running as well. So, but yeah, the thing that's using like the most CPU is this, that might be the meeting process and it's only using 70 megabytes for that. So, yeah. Oh, so, um, now back to some things that, that are missing. We, you know, whiteboard and annotation, the presenter modes, yeah. breakout rooms. Breakout rooms are not currently available. And they say that's that's on the yeah. on the short list. Um, but just want to reiterate mm-hmm. that um that they yeah, uh, big deal, especially there. in education. Yep. You know. Um, I wonder if that's why they haven't <laughs> put it to the A the A customers yet, you know, or something. Um, because like breakout rooms are so critical in EDU. I wonder if that might be part of it. So here's where, here's that location. If you want to find that um, fellow administrators, it's in the, this different local cache, uh, MS teams, and then backgrounds. So cool. Thanks for that, Tom. Oh, there, there you go. There's the environment variable. So local app data packages, MS teams, and then this squid. Uh, local cache. So yeah, do your local app data and then packages. Sweet. Very helpful. Um, yeah. So we showed being able to switch tenants during a meeting. That's, that's pretty rad. Um, and when you join and it automatically gives you the features from that tenant because it switches in the background, that's awesome, especially for your channel meetings. Cause you won't have to worry too much about the whole chat. Why doesn't chat work? Um, The back history missing. So this is something that's in, I'm going to get out of the meeting so I don't, you know, chew up resources unnecessarily, even though that dude, this VM is running really smoothly (laughs) for, for being a, an old virtual machine that usually is sluggish. Um, If I go here in the chat area, there's like the forward and back buttons. And if I go and kind of navigate through, pick a different channel. So in the old version of Teams, all of this navigation that I did, if I would hover over my back button, it was available to me. Like it would have like a little drop down of like my history that is not available in the new client. You just basically can only like go back, back, back. So that's something to note. Um, I have a video, a Teams tip about that, talking about how cool it is that it like pops out. Um, so that's not available to us yet, but you can just do back and forward. So we're partial part of the way there. Um, so that brings us to like, when should you switch to the new teams client? Um, Andy, I don't know if you want to cover this section from your perspective. I kind of put my bullets down, uh, on this right now, honestly, it's too early to make the switch if you're expecting any kind of consistency because this is early release slash public preview. So if you're here, you're someone like John or Daryl 
or myself or Tom, where you're kicking the tires to see what's going on with it and try to identify some of the gaps and some of the pain points that the your user base is, mm -hmm. is going to run into. So it's definitely, it's you can run it now. So if you're going to participate and like if you're going to uh, join it, or if you're going to join a meeting, you can participate, have a great experience. You want to chat internally in the organization, have a great experience. You want to participate in a team and a channel. You'll have a great experience there. If you are start, if you're like us and you live in the multi-tenant world, mm -hmm. this can help address some pain points. I can be in here yeah. across multiple tenants and I can join a meeting, I can chat, I can get my notifications and I don't have to worry about all the back and forth. But if you are dependent on those power user features, if you are a teacher, an educator, a trainer, and you live in Teams meetings all day, every day, and you use the whiteboard and the annotation tools and you use the breakout rooms and um, you know all the meeting features mm -hmm. that are there, that stuff's missing. So you're not going to switch today because you're not going to get that full presentation uh, experience. Um, if you are early adopter mm -hmm. and you really want to test out some of the, you know, the new things that they're rolling out, like the, the green screen effect that they're working with, you're going to need to use the, the Teams 2.0 client on that. Now, as we've seen, it's really easy to switch back and forth. So like from, you know, most business activities, if I'm participating, I can stay in the new teams. And if I run into something that doesn't work, switch back. And depending on your PC, it might be a 20 second switch over. And then you know, you pick up and, and you go from there back in the, in the classic client. I will give mm -hmm. um, kudos to the team behind this. They are updating that, that website. Uh, we posted in the chat window earlier where we got the table they are updating that with the feature parity and they are, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like they are pushing through that, um, that, that list pretty quickly. But the big thing to take away is that this is early access. So you are very much in a beta test <laughs> with this. So I uh, don't, don't depend on it right now, but mm -hmm. compared to where we were, wow, huge leap forward. And so it's really exciting to see. Yeah. So to kind of reiterate that a little bit, um, I was taking a couple more notes while, while you were, you know, giving your, like, what, what advice would you give your users? Um, I, 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 the same way, it's pretty easy to switch back and forth. It doesn't hurt much to, to try it out. I'm going to put this pro tip um, to uh, use the web client, the web client for compatibility needs. So, you know, if you want to explore this, note that you're going to switch back and forth maybe use the web client if you want to for me i think it depends on like what you're gonna what you need um the way i would break it down very simply if you manage a lot of teams don't do it yet because you're you're gonna run and you're gonna have a bad time if you're doing channel meet management stuff like that and if you do advanced meeting features don't do it yet um because you're gonna have a bad time for me that means Stream Deck support. That, that's the thing that would be keeping me from it. Um, if you're an educator and use breakout rooms, don't do it yet. Polls, things like that. If you're whiteboarding a lot, definitely don't do it because it's not available. Um, but like, like Tom, like Daryl, like me, Andy, if you monitor a lot of guest organizations because you're a consultant or you're, you, know, you have a lot of partners that you work with, like me as an architect working with Microsoft, um, it's probably very worth it for you. Like, you know, basically for me using the, if this was available on a Mac, I would basically have to decide is the not having to switch organizations or the easier switching, is that worth losing Stream Deck support for me? That's kind of where I'm at personally is like uh, Stream Deck or, you know, monitoring multiple tenants. You know, th those are, those, that's kind of a hard decision from my perspective because I, I I love my stream deck and using that for teams, but I also am very annoyed by having to like run you know multiple instances of the web browser. So personally, probably what I would do is I probably would make the switch early on my own Mac because I have two Teams devices that have muting and hang up buttons on them that aren't the stream deck. So I've got other ways to have my buttons. 
I, I wouldn't love it. Um, the other thing, like if you're just like a regular user, you're probably not the type of person who's watching a two hour meeting or two hour live stream about, you know, the new teams features. But if you're just like, I just use teams, I don't care about teams, but I use it. Um, you might be fine. <laughs> you know, honestly, this is one of those things where it's an, it's an interesting spot from like a it perspective, because generally when you run like a pilot program with your organization, you want to get early adopters. You want to get power users. You want like the people who are really going to use the crap out of it. With this one in its current state, you actually, if you wanted to run a pilot, I would want people who aren't power users because all the power user stuff isn't there yet. You know, so it's a little bit reverse of what you normally would do. Where I would say your weakest users that have the the oldest non-performant computers they probably are going to get the biggest benefit out of using Teams. Your people who are like the engineering laptop people, the people who use and squeeze all the life out of Teams, it's probably not ready for them yet from my perspective. So that's my take on it. Um, maybe just flip it on its head and think about the people who are crying the most about performance and all they do is chat and attend meetings and they don't run the meetings. Maybe they're your pilot group. Something to think about. So... Yeah, I know we're gonna we've we've started soft testing it and we haven't put together any kind of like formal testing on it, but I know before mm -hmm. we make the decision to announce it to the larger enterprise, it's gonna have to be probably out of uh, the public preview early access uh, phase. And then we'll do like a testing period on it to figure out like which knobs and switches are gonna be core for end users um mm -hmm. before before we look at a, a larger deployment, but our tentative timeline is probably into summer before we start looking at anything like that. And that's just going to yeah. depend on going back through this list and the feature parity and just checking off a lot of these, these switches as we go. Mm -hmm. um, Daryl brings up a really good point. Um, and I want to bring this to the, uh, to the chat window, but Daryl brings up a really good point. I'm still using multiple browser profiles. Uh, I need to open a doc from a different tenant. It opens in the same browser profile mm -hmm. as Teams. We didn't even test that, and that's another good scenario to mm -hmm. think about. Yeah. Like if um if I'm sharing a document and I'm in Andy Org and you know having a conversation with you and or Megan and they're in collab more. Like like how is that going to Mm -hmm. how's it going to try and open that up um that's the consultant life a lot more you're working in yeah. files a lot more with the guest yeah. um, i'm not a consultant but what i do is i have my day job and then i work with microsoft as an it partner right you know i give them a, i give them feedback and i do the tap and stuff like that so i'm not editing documents a whole lot so like in my world it's probably fine the multi-tenant switching in a consultant's world you, you're opening up files you're probably still going to be popping other browsers. Yeah. So it's a good, a, a good point. Yeah. And it just goes to show, yeah. like, I don't think anybody, any, even in, just in our conversation here over the last couple of hours, I don't think any two of us work in teams the same way. Like we, we kind of crisscross all uh, back and forth with all the, the different features and functionality that we're, mm -hmm. that we're, we're doing. I, I attend a ton of meetings. Yeah. I deliver a lot of trainings. I don't edit so many documents um, directly inside of teams, like for example, whereas like, you mm -hmm. know, you're going back and forth with some of the like tap content. You're probably filling some of that stuff out in the, in the teams yeah. browser more so than I am. Like um, it, it, you kind of pick and choose your own adventure, but I think what they've done here is a huge improvement over what we had. Yeah. I think they're getting the multi-tenant multi-access, right? I'm, I'm really happy with that. And then I think they're taking some of the, decision point away from the end user and just getting them to where they need to be to give them the best experience they don't have to think about it anymore and i think that's mm -hmm. great yeah yeah cool so when it comes to mac if it came to mac today would you use it Andy, yeah. in your daily life you would i well i think i would unless try i'm it. delivering a technical presentation and then i need you know some of yeah, the presenter yeah. features but like, i think I'm i would try it in my daily life i think i would like the multi-tenant I don't need the performance because I'm on an M2 MacBook Air and it's stupid fast already. Um, but I, I think I would do it for the multi-tenant. But like you, if I was going to talk in a meeting or present content, I think I would switch back. 
Yeah. Um, I don't think I would advise other people to use it quite yet. I don't think it's quite there, but something to point out as we kind of close out is, um, is, uh, this advice from Tom where he says, I think I'd recommend waiting a little bit for a bigger update. Um, he says, it sounds like maybe there's something in May. I haven't heard that myself, but, um, if there's like some major, like, Hey, we fixed 30% of the issues or, you know, here's the 10 things we added back into the client. If you get perhaps, a big wave like that, perhaps he's referencing it. the so. Microsoft 365 conference that is happening May 4th in Las Vegas. Yeah. So maybe there's something there that they would yeah. launch like, Hey, the top five top, you know, things yeah. you wanted, we got them. I don't know. I'm just speculating. I, I, <laughs> I have NDA access, but they have not told me anything about, you know, that. So, um, yeah, so I think it's something to be aware of, something to keep an eye out. I, I don't switch your 400,000 person tenant to yeah. it. Um, <laughs> you know. Now is the time <laughs> but, for testing and validation. Yeah getting your your governance right making sure like you're you're thinking yeah. about updating your training content you know your documents on how to tenant switch and talk to people across different organizations um i think mm -hmm. now's the time to to really start to explore and lock that in and then me personally i think in the summer probably into the fall is where we might see this more for a um, a general audience yeah yeah it might it, you might be thinking of piloting later this year yeah. or early next year. But like you said, this is coming. Start preparing for it. In the fall. Put like maybe your your IT friends on it. Um, start, you know, updating your videos and your docs and stuff like that. Um, better yet, maybe consider uh, launching the Learning Pathways app from adoption.microsoft because then they update all the documentation, you know. Um, like don't don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's all I've got to say about this. Maybe we'll revisit it in six months. One more thing. Out. I just Go noticed, ahead, um, I'm just going to pull it up on the screen real quick. Yeah. Where's the help in the lower left-hand corner? Oh, it's in the dot, dot, dots at the oh, top. That's yeah. Good click to there and then help. Yeah. That's where your feedback is too. <laughs> See, we've been going through this whole list and all these things back and forth, reading all these blogs, and that one completely mm -hmm. glanced over. All right. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> they moved your cheese. They moved Rough. my cheese. They got me. I'm going to have to go and tell everybody <laughs> where it is. Cool. Well, awesome, guys. Uh, I think that's about it for today. I really appreciate you uh, joining us again to do another deep dive. If you've got ideas for the next one in May, let us know. Um, both of Maybe us we'll have, have a couple a conferences for the next two weeks. So yeah, co-pilot's going to be interesting, but I, I, I want to like get something that we could demo at least <laughs> before we just talk about it. You know, um, imagine if as you soon will, as it lights up, yeah. that revolutionizes so, the way that you work. Yeah. It's really interesting. We can talk philosophically about it, but you know, <laughs> I, I want to be able to show too. <laughs> So, yeah keep those keep those yeah. ideas coming we're uh we're yeah. already starting to talk about the uh, the next one as john mentioned uh, we'll be in mm -hmm. conferences that we can't talk about next week and then the week after that you're gonna be comms, gonna be at comms v next in v denver next. yeah in denver. Uh, the week after next so april 25th and 26th i'm gonna be there um talking with my friend aaron Steele from microsoft about um devices and native teams features for advanced event stuff so um, we're going to be talking about like NDI, SDI, um, some of the the partnerships with like Epifan and Live Arena, stuff like that. Um, we, we did uh, AI producer. We did a live stream about that. So we're going to be showing that those types of things off. Aaron actually has a giveaway that he's going to be giving away uh, in the Q&A. So if you're around Denver, can make it to Denver, um, definitely register for that. It's going to be a fun time. I've heard... This is my first time going to Coms V next, but I hear that it's amazing and I hear that the food is really great. So I'm looking forward to that. And where are you going? Are you in a conference the week after next? Uh no. So we got the I got Redmond next week. And then um, mm -hmm. my next one will be the beginning of June. That will be 365 Educon in Washington, okay. DC. I have a promo code, Honeycut 100 
you know, ping me and I'll make go, sure yeah. that you, you get that. But if anybody is interested in an in-person event for all things Microsoft 365 and Power Platform, I do encourage you to come hang out at 365 mm-hmm. EduCon in DC. They're also doing 365 EduCon in Seattle and in Chicago. I'm already yeah. um, on the list for Seattle. Looking really forward to that one. That'll be in Microsoft's um, backyard. And yeah. that's going to be um, in the uh, end of August, I believe. And then okay. um, Chicago will be around Halloween. It feels like it's definitely like conference season. Yeah. <laughs> conferences are coming back. Uh, Daryl said, you know, M365 conference is coming. That's the first week of May. Um, so uh, you might have seen a pop up in Teams that drove you crazy um, <laughs> <laughs> that advertised it. But that is coming. That's going to be a good one in Vegas. I won't be able to get there because that'd be three weeks in a row. Um, plus, I wouldn't be able to travel there, uh, work, pay for it and stuff. Um, there's that. Uh, also, I saw this call for speakers for Metaverse One in September is open as well. Um, awesome guys that run that conference uh, coming up. So check out Metaverse One too. But uh, I think that's it. We, there's a huge yeah. calendar of stuff, but... Um, We'll see you guys in mid to late May to talk about something uh, next time. Follow <laughs> us both on Twitter um, if you don't already. And, um, you know, I'll throw up uh, my my Twitter right there. You can scan and follow me. And then in three, two, one, Andy's Twitter. Follow him. We'll talk about those things coming up. We'll talk about the next one of these if you uh, – want um subscribe to the youtube channels so you can uh follow along with what's going on so awesome well thanks andy this was a good one it was fun yep all right we'll talk to you guys later have a great weekend take care everybody bye and turn off my microphone and mute and kill my camera before i go off (laughs) see you guys (laughs)